Good afternoon, all. I hope we are audible to you. So, welcome to our sixth session. Today, we have Dr. Sunita taking a topic on difficult pain for us. So, we can start with ma'am's presentation. It will extend in like 14 to 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. We can have our case presentation at 4 p.m. Followed by its discussion, we can wind up our session by 4:30. Thank you all for joining in. So we have completed basics of uh, pain and its treatment. Uh, now we are moving on to difficult pain. So what are the? Uh, there are some patients whom we face. Uh, it is very difficult to treat the pain, and we don't know what to do. Uh, so, Dr. Sunita Daniel, uh, who has uh, done her MRCP in palliative medicine from UK, and um, she has uh, experience both uh, abroad as well as in India, will be speaking about um, difficult pain and its management. Dr. Sunita, uh, welcome you, and uh, it's over to you for the session. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. Um, am I audible to everyone? Yes, you are, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Sunil and Pali Media for giving me another opportunity um, to take a session. Uh, before I begin, I just want to mention that um, it's been raining quite heavily here. So uh, my power supply has been going on and off over the last two days. Um, so um, right now I'm on Wi-Fi. In case I go off, uh, it will be because I lost the Wi-Fi, so I'll be going to a hotspot and getting my mobile on. So there'll be about five minutes break. That's okay. Um, right. Before I start, can can I just have a quick introduction? Because last last week I didn't I didn't do that. So just uh, go through each one of you. Just mention a name and um, what specialty you're working now and which place. If that's okay. Yes, ma'am. We can. Okay. Okay. So a brief introduction, you can say your name and your resignation. So we can start with Dr. Praveen. Can you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, sir, we didn't get Hello? you. Uh, yes, doctor, you can speak. Hello? Yes, doctor. Can you hear? Yes, yes. Hello, Dr. Praveen, can you hear us? Hello, I'm Dr. Praveen from Vishakapatnam, working as a medical officer. Okay. Uh, Dr. Geeta? Uh, doctor, we can't hear you, doctor. Okay, uh, Dr. Geeta, we are unable to hear you. Uh, yeah. Can you hear? No. You uh, I'm Dr. Geeta. Andrew. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Ong? Yes, uh, I'm Doctor Obang Tongla from Nagaland, Deputy Director, Health and Family Welfare. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor Sanjay? Yes, yes, Madam. Good afternoon, Madam. Uh, so, uh, can you uh, brief introduction of yourself, sir? Uh, myself, Dr. Sanjay, uh, from Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, uh, Gandhi Medical College, Gopal. Thank you, sir. Dr. Chirag? Yes, uh, GCRI team? Hello. Uh, yes. yes. I'm Dr. Chirag from. Uh, uh, Ahmedabad from BJ Medical College, working as an associate professor in emergency medicine department. Thank you, doctor. Hello. GCRI team? Uh, I am Dr. Darshan Patel, senior resident, palliative medicine, GCRI. Dr. Mega, junior resident in GCRI. Uh, Dr. Bhavna Patel, associate professor, palliative medicine, GCRI. Dr. Mayur, first year resident in palliative medicine, GCRI Ahmedabad. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. Hikatu. Uh, 
Yeah. Yes, Dr. Hikatu. Yes, myself, Dr. Hikatu, first year's palliative medicine in GCRI. Dr. Sriniti? Hello. Yes, Doctor, you can speak. Hello. Yes, Doctor, we can hear you. I'm Dr. Sriniti, junior resident in PSU Hospital, Coimbatore. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor Ambali? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Ambli from Kannur. I'm working as a consultant. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Richa? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Richa Singh, working as a medical officer in GCRI. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Anumol? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Doctor, you, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Anumol. I'm a transfusion medicine specialist, currently working as medical officer in Kerala Health Services. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor Mittu? Hello, I am Dr. Mittu Vijay. I am from Trivandrum. I am a dentist by profession. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Madhulika? Clinical Oncologist. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Oncology, PSU Hospital, Kaimbatore. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor Grace? Uh, Dr. Grace, can you unmute and speak? Uh, Dr. Purnima? Uh, I'm Dr. Grace is the name from Nigeria. Okay, just a minute. Uh, Dr. Grace, it wasn't clear. Uh, Dr. Purnima? Uh, yeah, hello everyone. I'm Dr. Purnima. I'm a neurologist with infectious palliative neurology. Can you hello? Uh, yes, Dr. Grace. Yes, I'm Dr. Grace from Nigeria. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Now we can hear you clearly. Hello. Yes, Doctor, we have heard you. Okay, I said I'm um, Dr. Grace from Nigeria. Okay. Thank okay, you. Dr. I'm a senior registrar in family medicine, federal teaching hospital. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Dr. Aki. Hello everyone. Um, good evening to all. I am Dr. Rakhi Das, currently working as medical officer in CRK. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Amrita? Dr. Amrita, can you unmute yourself and speak? Uh, Dr. Kiran? Hello. Uh, yes, Dr. Amrita. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Amrita here. I'm working as a scientist in NICPR. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Kiran? I am Dr. Kiran Rathod, working as a medical officer in Spihan Chennapur. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ananda Krishnan? Oh, hello. Uh, yes, Dr. A brief introduction, sir. Oh, okay. uh, good evening. I am uh, Dr. Ananda Krishnan. I am working in the Central Reserve Police Force. I am currently posted in Recruit Training Center, Kannur. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Prayarna? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Jitin. Yes, Doctor. Doctor Jitin, I'm a second Navy hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. doctor. Sunita, you can okay. Th thank you very much, Raj Lakshmi, um, and thank you all for uh, just my intro introducing yourself. It's quite, uh, I, I think, I think it's good to know about the uh, you know the the varied uh, specialties each of you work in and the different places we are uh, you know communicating from. Okay, so we'll start with the presentation. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? Um, the next forty-five minutes, what I'm planning to do is um, just give you one one or two slides about a case study. 
Um, and as you know, the t topic is difficult pain. So I'll be doing it what are the scenarios and how do we go forward managing that patient. In between, there'll be a few MCQs um, relevant to topic and um, you know, I probably will give you maybe less than 10 seconds to answer. Uh, those who know the answer, just shout out, just un unmute yourself and shout out the answer. Uh, I'll briefly mention neuropathic pain um, and the role of adjuvants uh, in pain management, which has, I'm sure has been covered in detail uh, in the previous sessions. Uh, and also I'll um, finish off with uh, mentioning about lignocaine and ketamine. Next slide, please. So we've got uh, Mrs. S, who is 67. She's got metastatic castrumor breast. She's post um, radic therapy. She had a surgery and she had chemo. She had all the treatments um, possible. And she's now known to our team. Um, she complains of pain all over the body, which is worse in areas of bony metastasis. Um, the, she's on diclofenac, which is causing her severe gastritis. She's um, unable to sleep and she's asking to be killed because of the severity of the pain. Next slide, please. She's currently on paracetamol, uh, 650 milligram three times a day. Morphine, 10 milligram Q4 thoroughly. Bisacoral, 10 milligram HS. Uh, this is helping her, but uh, the pain relief is only partial. We've planned to increase the morphine to 15 milligram Q4 thoroughly, but Mrs. S is unhappy and she does not want this treatment. Next slide, please. So uh, she has what probably what you would say she has got a difficult pain. And um, when, when the introduction to pain and the pain management was covered, um, you must have known that uh, usually 71 to 76% of patients have good pain relief in the learned object, and it's usually effective. Um, can you all hear me? It says my connection is unstable. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Sunita, we can hear you, but uh, in between we lost for a couple of seconds. Shall I just, uh, my video is already gone. Okay, fine. I'll continue. Just let me know if uh, it's any problem. I'll move position. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, what, we f what we see that 70% of patients with advanced cancer and 65% of patients with dying from non-malignant disease have pain at some point uh, in their lifetime, in their, in, their, in their disease process. And among them, one third will have just single pain, one third can have two pains, and one third can have up to three or more pains. So pain is a very common symptom, especially in cancer patients. And sometimes 80% will have more than one pain. But the good news is that about 75% of patients, when we do the correct WHO uh, you know, three-step ladder, we're able to have a good pain relief for those patients. And we are left with about 10% of patients where the pain is difficult to control. And so we're going to deal, um, we're going to see how we can sort of try and manage that. Next slide, please. Okay, first MCQ, what could be the cause of uncontrolled pain? Is it because the pain responds poorly to opioids? Is it because the pain is episodic and breaks through despite background opioid analgesia? Or C, caused by non-physical factors such as psychosocial distress, or is it all of the above? Anybody? All of the above. All of the above. Next slide, please. Good. So uh, uh, it can be any of the three reasons. So uh, it, it could be an opioid non, you know, non-sensitive pain because neuropathic pain only 50% will respond to opioid. It is because uh, maybe her background pain is controlled, but she's got this episodic pain that's called a breakthrough pain, which is not getting under controlled. Uh, and it could also be caused by non-physical factors like, like social distress. Next, please. So what is the first step? Um, so the first step that we say in palliative medicine is believe that the patient about the pain. Pain is what the patient says hurt. I'm sure you must have heard this statement before when you learned about introduction to pain. So we always tend to believe our patients um, when they say they've got pain. So uh, we, you know, we might think that actually they're on, on morphine medication Why are they still in pain. But um, in, our, in, in our cohort of patients, there can be reasons why the pain is not under control. So we don't say that they're just, uh, you know, they're just putting on pain because um, they want higher dose of morphine. It's not like that. We always try to believe what the patient says and uh, when they say they've got pain. Next slide. Step two, correct for any correctable factors. Look for the cause of pain. Now, um, this patient, um, if, if she was known to us initially, and she, if initially she, if she presented with the breast cancer and she had treatment, uh, and 
if suppose a diagnosis she didn't have any metastasis and suddenly she had complaints of pain. So the most common thing that we would be thinking of, has she developed a new, new metastasis? Look for the site of pain. Is there a new bony batch or not? And um, that means, can we do something for that other than the analgesics? So if she's got a new bony ment, we can give her radiotherapy. Um, is she, if she's got a, uh, you know, a recurrence of the disease, is she eligible for more chemotherapy? Um, if there's a swelling, can it be removed? So all those options we should be thinking of, not just breast cancer, any other cancer. Uh, when they present with a new onset of pain on an already stable patient, is there anything that we can do to correct the pain? So step three is um, check the adherence to treatment. Now, um, this was a review done. Um, on, it came in the um, journal on pain practice. That find compliance, the adherence, and the analysis of pain management. Uh, and what are the causes? What are the reasons for the patient not adhering to treatment? So uh, these are the various reasons that's mentioned in, in the literature review. So what could be the reason why the patient is not adhering to the pain management? It could be the ignorance about the disease and the pain. So the patient probably doesn't know the, the cause of her pain. Probably the, the family having told her that she's got cancer. So she doesn't take this strong, she doesn't want to take a strong medication like morphine to treat her pain when she doesn't know that she, she doesn't have, she, she thinks she doesn't have cancer or she doesn't know that she has got cancer. So it could be because the ignorance about the disease and the pain. It could be the perceived medication in a fitness. So probably they're not taking it round the clock. They're just taking it as and when needed and feels that the medication is not working. Or if the medication is not on the right dose, the pain is not going away. They think that the medication is not working. Um, some people don't like a frequent daily dosing. So unfortunately, we, or most of the centers only have short acting morphine, which we have to give every four hours. And sometimes the patients might forget to take that. So, uh, you know, they don't like taking too many tablets too frequently. So they don't, you know, that could be a reason why they don't take the treatment on time. Anxiety depression, which is an important cohort, the psychosocial symptoms, the psychological effects. Um, so they could be having um, a depressive illness along with the cancer diagnosis or the cancer itself is causing the anxiety. And because of that, they're non-compliant to treatment. They could have high le levels of emotional and psychosocial stress. Uh, they could even have lack of faith in the doctor or health services. So previous, previous experiences with health services would make them you know, distrust the doctors and they wouldn't want to take the medications advised by the doctors. Financial problems. Um, I've marked that in red because it's very important for our population, um, especially the patients who come to the private sector uh, where they have to pay for everything. Even the cost of medications is very important to think about. It could be loneliness and unsupportive relationship when they don't have anybody to support them at home, to talk to them, to remind them to take medications. It could be fear of adverse effects, which I think is the most common thing we find in our patients when we, are, when we first start them on morphine. They're worried about the side effects of morphine. They're worried about addiction, lots of myths about morphine. So some people say that... Um, some people mention that, uh, you know, um, you have to bear a little bit of pain. You shouldn't give strong medications uh, just because um, you've got pain. So it could be some cultural effect also. It could be the communication between the doctor and patient. So we haven't explained properly to the patient why um, they should be on pain medications and what's the need for that. So it could be because of that. Uh, and I generally, I decide not to take any medication. So this has been found in the literature as to the various reasons why different patients uh, don't stick to their treatment. Next slide, please. So financial uh, implications. So this is a, a price of the various um, opioids that we use uh, commonly. So you can see that morphine is the cheapest. It's um, 10 milligram Q4 hourly costs only six rupees per day. Um, unlike fentanyl, which is a strong opioid, and chocolate is quite expensive to 15 uh, rupees per day for that um, a three day patch. So, um, which has you know, uh, um, changed once every three days. And from doll, 15 milligram to 6 will cost 32 rupees per day. Next slide, please. Step four. Um, so, you've, looked, you, you've uh, seen whether there's any correctable factors, and in that, one of them, it could be, uh, and, you know, the um, adherence, uh, lack of adherence to treatment, one of them could be the emotional factors. So specifically look for the, if there's any evidence of clinical anxiety or depression, um, look for insight about the diagnosis and prognosis. So what does the patient know about the disease? As I mentioned before, that, you know, that could be the reason why they're not taking treatment. So talk to them about that, ask them about the insight about diagnosis and prognosis, and also look for any other psychosocial problems. And even in that, 
You have to try and correct the correctable. Next slide, please. Step five, review the treatment regime. Um, basically, review the nature of the pain, reconsider analgesics, and reconsider adjuvant measures. So the reason I mentioned that there was a, a clinical um, case that I had, I had come across uh, when a patient had a metastatic prostate cancer uh, who normally has a very bad uh, bony pain was admitted for uncontrolled bony She was supposed to have morphine infusion and uh, the pain was um, well settled. We were planning discharge for him and he was all stable. But one, one day morning when I went to the ball grounds, there was a lot of problem because the patient was in a lot of pain overnight. Um, everybody were panicking. The nurses were panicking. Uh, you know, he, nothing was settling it. And um, in between, the nurses were giving him some bolus of saline and telling me, actually, he's responding to the IV bolus of saline. Uh, so maybe it's you know he doesn't have the pain. So but the, the patient is not the one who who puts on a pain. He was he was, he was that's not like his nature. So I was a bit confused. So when I went and examined the patient and, and uh, spoke to him, what actually happened was um, he developed a new pain. He was in hospital. He was constipated for a couple of days, and um, you know the the pain that he was he's complaining overnight was a new abdominal pain, a colicky type of pain, which is completely not related to his um, prostate cancer and the bone pain. And uh, they were giving morphine, but unfortunately, it was not working. Um, he needed some anti anti spasmodic medication. And because of the colicky nature, the spasmodic nature of the pain, it comes and goes in between. So there are periods when he's pain free on his own. And that could be the reason why the, the saline boluses work. So, always, 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 when the patient complains of pain, we try and find the nature of the pain. Is it a new pain or the same pain? So, that's the first question I always ask the patient Is it the same pain that you were having before, or is it a new pain? So that was a completely different pain, which responded to a buscopan, better than morphine. So always try to ask that. Then always reconsider analysis. Try and um, consider whether we have to add more medications and also consider the adjuvant measures that we are giving to the patient. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, you've all learned the WHO step ladder uh, in the pain management um, session. But this is a step ladder, but this is just uh, targeting on the neuropathic pain management which also can roughly follow a step ladder, uh, you know, management. In this case, we have mentioned uh, step one is corticosteroid, but that is um, probably ap applicable only to the, our cancer patients. So we need to understand that when we um, suggest corticosteroids as a first line of corticosteroids for our, our group of patients, we should never forget the long-term side effects of corticosteroids. So we should always be, um, um, you know, closely monitoring the patient um, and, uh, the patient selection to give corticosteroids must be uh, very, very so blindly and for long duration can have lots of long-term side effects. It's effective when I mean, there's a um, tumor pressing on the on the nerves, causing a severe neuropathic pain because it has got anti-inflammatory action. Uh, so it can reduce the tumor edema and um, can help with the pain. And it's quite um, it can, uh, potentially acts quite quickly. So you could start that as a step one. There's no other contraindications to give a steroid, and then um, or you could you could straight away start them both together because the the conventional neuropathic uh, agents will take some time to start working. So we can start with the antidepressants or anti-epileptic also along with the corticosteroids. Um, the thing with the steroids is um, be for one week. If you think that the pain is not getting better, then it's better not to continue with that because it's not going to work. So step one corticosteroid. Step two. We start with either an antidepressant or an anti-epileptic. Normally, I don't tend to start them both together. And I don't normally tend to use any combination tablets because there's lots available now where you've got both the anti-conversion um, and antidepressant together. I don't personally tend to use them because um, I believe in starting one of them and titrating it up till they develop any side effect or, or the pain relief is better. If they develop side effect, then I won't titrate it further. Then I'll add the anti-epileptic. So step three is combine the antidepressant and antiepileptic together um, and see. And again, if it doesn't get better, you go to step four, which is the NMG receptor blocker. Next slide, please. So um, we've known lots of medications in neuropathic pain, but uh, again, careful patient drug selection is important to manage neuropathic pain. And uh, the thing to remember is if it's a costly medication, it not, it's not necessarily the best. The, um, the drug companies might come and tell you that pregabalin is better than gabapentin. Evidence doesn't say that. And pregabalin um, is expensive than gabapentin. So obviously, we don't have to go for the cost of medication because it's not necessarily the best. 
and uh, whatever treatment uh, once they reach um, once these patients these cohort of patients um, reach us or we start seeing them they would have had all the treatments done and they would have lost a lot of money so we don't want to put additional burden on them be careful for patients next slide please question which of the following would you use as first line to treat neuropathic pain is it amitriptyline venlafaxine duloxetine or pregabalin anybody uh jeda ma'am has said that amitriptyline well then yeah that's correct next slide amitriptyline yeah that's right next slide please amitriptyline so these are the list of medications um that is um, yeah i got to answer some amitriptyline that's right so amitriptyline is still the drug of choice and the first line medication we suggest obviously careful patient selection it has got um unfortunately higher side effect profile than the other antidepressants that's why you know if if you, the patient can't tolerate amitriptyline we go to amitriptyline uh, which is uh, you know um, slightly has got slightly less side effect profile I usually go with um, the range is given as 25 to 75 mg HS. So I usually start with 10 mg at night and within three days make it up to 25 and go up to 75. If it doesn't work in in better, then add in the antidepressants. Or you could start with imipramine, the same dosage uh, and tighten it up to 100 mg HS. Other options are nortriptyline, venlafaxine, and duloxetine. Duloxetine is quite. Um, uh, I've seen people use lots of lots of duloxetine now uh, as a first line. Duloxetine is um, quite a newer one and has got less side effect profile. Uh, according to NICE guidelines, it is licensed only for diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy, where duloxetine is a drug of choice. Um, you can use it for cancer pain. Uh, again, the mechanism is same, but it, it's obviously more costly than amitriptyline. So, for cancer pain and all types of other, other uh, neuropathies, I would go for amitriptyline as first line. If it's got high side effect profile, then really I'll go for duloxetine. Venlafaxine I usually use as a third line medication uh, if none of these um, antidepressants are working, and if I still need an antidepressant, then I'll stop this and change to venlafaxine. I usually don't give two antidepressants together just to treat pain. Next slide, please. Antidepressants um, again with pain, adenine valproate, gabapentin, pregabalin, and clonazepam. We usually, uh, in cancer pain management, we usually go with gabapentin or pregabalin as first line. the The problem with gabapentin is um, it, it it has to be given as a thrice daily dosage. The way the the slide is showing the maximum dosage. Normally, what we start is either with 100 milligram three times a day. If it's a frail patient, elderly patient, you can start with 100 milligram once a day, and gradually within next day you can make it BD, and the third day you can make it TID. And gradually, in some patients, you can start with 300 milligram once a day, and again increase it up. Pregabalin, uh, the PCO4 says to start with um, 75 milligram BD, but in our Indian population, I usually go low and start with either 25 BD or 50 BD. Again, renal impairment, uh, the maximum dose is only up to 150 BD. Um, otherwise, you can even go up to 300 BD. Again, uh, the doses that is uh, mentioned in the literature and the books are all for Western population. So we always go with a lower dose. Um, I usually go with a lower dose in our population because our patients do not tolerate such high doses. Clonazepam, as we all know, is a benzodiazepine. Uh, it can be added for neuropathic pain. It helps you sleep at night, and it can be added in addition to the other medications for neuropathic pain. Carbamazepine, um, again, one of the um, one of the typical example of a, a neuropathic pain that carbamazepine is supposed to be a drug of choice. Can anybody say that? I don't mean that's an MCQ, but Anybody knows which is a uh, for trigeminal neuralgia? Trigeminal neuralgia, that's right. So carbamazepam is a drug, is a, is a drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia. One of the things that you have to remember when prescribing carbamazepam to um, Asian population is there's a higher chance of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome for Asian population compared to Caucasian population for carbamazepam. So, uh, and I've seen patients um, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome with carbamazepine on a patient who has been started on for for trigeminal neuralgia. So that's something that you need to, um, you know, keep in your mind. Sunita, we lost you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. 
Right. Um, we've got a, a meta-analysis and a 2009 uh, published in the General Hospital Psychiatry uh, Journal, which says that uh, they've done the synthesis of all the, all the medications um, that has been tried for neuropathic pain, and they've, they've suggested a stepwise approach to manage neuropathic pain. Again, they also have suggested that you go with tricyclic antidepressants first line. And then you can go to either uh, add in gabapentin or switch to duloxetine, or you can add in pregabalin. Next slide, please. Uh, the algorithm that this suggests is, as I mentioned, uh, diabetic neuropathy, duloxetine is a drug of choice. If by any chance duloxetine is contraindicated, you go for amitriptyline. All the other types of neuropathic pain, go with amitriptyline as first line. And if amitriptyline is contraindicated, go to pregabalin. That's the anticonvulsant. Next slide, please. WHO has recently uh, published a pain management guideline. They were mostly for uh, cancer pain. Uh, it's a very interesting document to read. Um, it's, it's got evidence based of all the medications that we commonly use. Now, for neuropathic pain session, uh, they haven't found any superior evidence for either for safety or for superiority of any of these medications, the gabapentin or pregabalin, above the other, like amitriptyline. So what they've suggested is still go for amitriptyline as a first-line treatment neuropathic pain. Um, you can still give the others gabapentin or pregabalin, but they haven't found any evidence of superiority. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I said that we would be mentioning something about adjuvants um, to manage neuropathic pain. So uh, the, proper, the, the conventional adjuvants that we use are, as I've mentioned now, that there are some, some indications for using um, lignocaine infusion. And this is not, uh, it's com it's not commonly used, but um, it's been mentioned, and there's some guidelines for that. Uh, we, can, we can manage a difficult neuropathic pain or difficult pain with um, IV lignocaine infusions. And um, the indications that they have suggested is either a severe, it's a severe cancer-related neuropathic pain syndrome, which is inadequately responding. It's not responding to the standard therapies. Um, and pruritus also has got some evidence. Uh, indication that, uh, it has got significant cardiac disease or significant hepatic impairment, um, hypertension, the VP is uh, more than 160 millimeter mercury, or the patient's already on some other sodium channel blocking agents like uh, anti amitriptyline, amiodarone, and uh, beta blockers. Next slide, please. So um, which of the following is an absolute contraindication for lignocaine infusions? Anybody? Hypertension. No. Renal failure? Nope. Next slide. According to the guidelines, apparently hypokalemia or hypomagnesia is given as the absolute contraindication for uh, lignocaine infusion. So hypotension is not because it can cause hypertension, so it's not um, a contraindication. Next slide, please. So uh, the... Um, the prior allergies to uh, obviously local anesthetics, we cannot give them anymore. Hypokalemia and hyper hypomagnesemia. Previous history of epilepsy or unexplained seizures, but not stroke. And uh, obviously cardiac complications. If there's a severe intraventricular heart block, it's not managed by pacemaker or Wolf Parkinson syndrome um, and um, stroke Adam syndrome. So the absolute contraindications for use of lignocaine. Next slide, please. So how do you give it? Now, this is again from the guidelines. Um, um, I've only used it once in the ward and that was an acute hospital. Uh, I haven't used it in the hospital setting at all. What we normally use is you use lignocaine or silocard, um, 500 milligram lignocaine in five, five, five ml, which is 100 milligram per ml undiluted lignocaine. And you start as an infusion. You can give a subcutaneous infusion, so that is compatible. And you, know, you don't have any um, sort of um, side effects at the local, local site. Comments at 0.5 mg per kg per hour. And the infusion rate can be increased to 1.5 mg per kg per hour as, as conveyor subcutaneous infusion. Um, so you, you calculate the, the total dose by calculating the patient's weight and you calculate the to total dose and then you put that in a 24 hour syringe and then um, you start at 1 mg per hour. So that's 24 hourly that dose goes in. So the appropriate volume. Usually, if it's IV infusion, I haven't used this IV infusion, you can give 1 to 5 mg per kg IV over 1 to 4 hours. I'm, I'm sure those with anesthetic background must have done this um, in ICUs, but... Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I haven't used it, and um, probably in the question and answer section, if you have any experience using Lignocin, you can um, share with us. Next slide. 
Okay. How do you monitor for if there's any um, any toxicities? Um, you can use it. Um, so prior to starting the infusion, you have to check the ECG, obviously because of heart problems, uh, BP, heart rate and respiratory rate and pain score and sedation score. Every 15 minutes for the first hour, you have to monitor, monitor the BP, heart rate and respiratory rate. And after uh, at two hours, four hourly, six hourly, eight and 10 and 12 hours after commence of infusion, you have to check the same thing, the BP, heart rate, respiratory rate, pain and sedation score. After that, four hourly obs observations, the same thing. And after 24 hours, you have to look for, uh, reach of the ECG again. The potential toxicities are, uh, that means the patients on the infusion, if they suddenly develop symptoms like perioral numbness or tingling or metallic taste, tinnitus, uh, paresthesia, drowsiness and hypertension or light headedness, you will have to stop the infusion because that could be a sign of impending toxicity. Next slide, please. Adjuvants, again, this must have been covered in the uh, pain management um, session. So secondary analysis of adjuvants are uh, used um, to manage the main, uh, along with the, the primary analgesics, uh, depending on the cause of pain. So I've already mentioned corticosteroids, which can reduce the, um, the neuropathic pain, it can reduce inflammation. Corticosteroids are all also used for other types of pain. One is the uh, headache um, ca caused by, uh, you know, brain meds causing raised endocrine tension causing headache. It can also be used for bowel obstruction, uh, abdominal pain, colicky pain, because the bowel obstruction can, it can reduce in inflammation and can help with that. Vaccine, uh, antispasmodic agents um, like buscopan, hyoscine butyl bromide, and glycopyrrhine can be used. Uh, again, if, the, if it's um, oral cancer or a head and neck cancer, if it's an infection going on, that is worsening the pain, then you can give some antibiotics and see whether that will help with the pain. Um, gastric pain, you can use antacids. The other stuff that is mentioned in the guidelines are palliative RT. So bone pain um, causing worsening of the symptoms, give palliative RT. Bisphosphonate, obviously, for bone pain. Uh, radioisotopes and monoclonal antibodies, depending on the cause of pain and the type of cancer causing the pain. Next slide, please. Okay, so coming back to our step, um, 10 step process, we come to step six where uh, you've mentioned opioid switch. Now, um, those who do not tolerate, there, 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 are, uh, there could be a cohort of patients who wouldn't tolerate uh, oral morphine and they sometimes can do well on under opioid. So uh, usually what happens is when we increase the dose of morphine, they can develop, an, uh, they can develop um, side effects, unacceptable side effects, and they do not tolerate morphine. So uh, what are the other two that's available in India is fentanyl and methadone are the other, only other step three opiates currently available in India. Next slide. Uh, morphine um, is metabolized to the M3G uh, glucuronidate, M6G glucuronidate, and nor morphine and other, other metabolites. Now, the, 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 the M3G glucuronidase, the, um, there has been different explanations about that. Initially, it was thought that um, it is a potential for causing all the side effects. Some people um, believe that it has got an antagonizing effect on the morphine receptors and it will actually reduce the, um, the, uh, the pain analgesic effect of morphine. Now, M63 glucuronidase is the principal um, um, you know, the metabolite that causes um, the analgesic effect of morphine. And M3G is believed to be um, causing the side effects. Next slide, next bit. So some people um, generate more of M3G um, than uh, M6G and that, because of genetic predisposition, it is thought to be that that is causing poor tolerance to morphine. And that, uh, so because of that, they might do better on a, um, you know, when you switch the opioid to another one. Next slide. Next. I'm, I'm going to mention it briefly about fentanyl. Uh, the commonly used one is a patch. Um, I'm not sure whether this is available in all the sites or uh, everybody can use it, but I'll just quickly mention that because for completion's sake. Uh, we can give fentanyl infusion. In our center, we used to give fentanyl only in the ICU. Um, and you can dilute the fentanyl. Uh, it's quite quick acting. So you have to, this, you know, giving a bolus infusion doesn't last long. So if you have got continuous pain, you have continuous infusion. So dilute 200 microgram of fentanyl. What, what we used to do in our practice was dilute with 20 ml normal slime and start at 2 ml per hour. Uh, abroad in UK, we don't normally use fentanyl. We use alfentanyl uh, as sub-Q infusion. Now, patches are currently available in, in India. I've, I've used in my setting. They're 12.5, 25 microgram, 50 microgram patches. Patches work with the method of transdermal drug absorption, where it's absorbed through the skin. Hence, it's effective in bowel, bowel obstruction, vomiting, and NPO patients. Next slide, please. Why do I use fentanyl? Usually when there's an unacceptable side effect of morphine. 
some patients are having renal failure. Fentanyl is safe. Um, it's a safe drug for renal failure. So for renal failure patients, um, when morphine accumulates, which I switch to fentanyl, which the patient can afford. When oral or subcut dose is inappropriate, um, then you can use fentanyl. And sometimes compliance is poor. Uh, some people, you know, it's okay with uh, having a patch on rather than oral medications. Next slide, please. The important thing to remember is this is a uh, patch, transdermal patch, which is changed every three days and usually at the same time of the day. It's less constipating than morphine. Um, I, I had one of the patients who was quite affordable patient who, that, that was the only reason that I switched from morphine to fentanyl was because uh, the constipation was a major issue for him and he wouldn't take morphine and he was quite okay with fentanyl and he could, he could afford the patch also. So there's less constipating and usually if you're on laxatives, you don't have to reduce the laxative dose if you're switching to fentanyl. Uh, thing to remember is direct contact with heat can increase the drug absorption. So if a patient has got fever or suddenly develops fever, they can go into potential can develop. Oh, I, I, I apply to a dry and non-inflamed or non-irradiated skin, usually in the upper arm or the trunk. And um, you should be careful to avoid, you look for non-hairy areas. If there's hair, a hairy area, then you don't actually shave them, you just trim them because shaving them can increase the vascularity. So you don't, you don't advise shaving. And uh, depending on the patch adherence, we sometimes ad advise them to put a microphone tape also if the patch, depending on if the patch doesn't stay there. Next slide, please. Um, the thing to remember is uh, transdermal method of drug application is not preferable for unstable pain uh, because it takes 12 to 24 hours for the drug to raise a therapeutic level. So the patient has got very bad pain, very severe pain. If you put a patch on now, it doesn't. It doesn't cause any difference at all it, uh, when you first start the patch. It at least takes 12 to 24 hours to start working. Um, and then it becomes stabilized. So you have to con if, if you should continue with the oral morphine or whatever opioid you were using before, at least for 12 to 24 hours, still the patch reaches a the therapeutic level. Uh, rough conversion is 25 microgram patches roughly equal to 75 milliliter of oral morphine in 24 hours. So normally for starting dose, I go with a 12.5 dose, which is roughly equal to half of the oral morphine in 24 hours, equal to the what we normally start. And for stable pain, used patches will still have active drugs. So you have to dispose it very, very carefully and it should be kept away from the children. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, I hope you, it's clear, uh, the patch size. So it can be upper outer arm, uh, it can be on the upper chest, um, upper back and side of the chest. And uh, if you've got two patches, sometimes you have to use uh, to get the correct uh, you know, dosage. You have to get 125 patch and 112.5 to make it 37.5. So use two patches side by side and make sure that the, everybody knows that the patient is on two patches and rotate, keep rotating the side. So once you put this uh, on one side after three days, take it and put it on a different new side rather than using the same side. Keep rotating the side. Next slide, please. Okay, step seven. Pain is still not better. Is there any role for interventions or any role for non-pharmacological measures? Interventions in pain management is um, quite an important thing as far as I would say Indian scenario of uh, palliative medicine is concerned because this is the start of the specialist. So there's a lot of role for interventions in pain management in palliative medicine here. As compared to Western population, where Western doctors, where um, it was mostly the physicians who was doing palliative medicine there. And it still has got a role in, uh, in for selected patients um, in our scenario. Next slide, please. This is the examples of some of the invasive analytic techniques that we can be used, um, uh, including the nerve blockade. You can, you can start with trigger point injections. Um, you can give peripheral nerve blockade, like intercostal pain. You can give intercostal nerve blockade, femoral blockade, sciatic nerve, or you know, upper limb pain with brachial plexus blo blockage, psoas blockage, paravertebral um, sensory nerve root blockage. For, that's a peripheral thing. So central, obviously in the spinal cord, you can do epidural and anesthesia or endothelial pump. Um, it's quite popular now. Again, I think I, as far as I know, very expensive for the patient. So careful patient selection is important. We, can, we do have other uh, neurodestructive uh, procedures like rhizotomy, where um, the selection of the um, nerves, spinal cord nerves are damaged. Chordotomy is the damaging of the, or, um, you know, affecting the, uh, pain and temperature sen sensations of the spinal cord, um, you know, that, that nerves are uh, damaged or are uh, ablated. Um, again, uh, careful patient selection. Um, patients with uh, usually with prognosis of less than six months, six months to one year should also only be selected because once you do a chordotomy, there's a chance of patient developing very severe uh, mirror pain or different pain after a year. Six months to one year, they can have the pain coming back um, or they can have a different pain which is more, more severe than the normal pain. So usually there's a careful patient selection to 
uh, for cord autonomy patients. You can use, also use um, radio frequency ablations um, and intrathecal phenol. Next slide, please. What are the non pharmacological um, you know, uh, uh, approaches we can use for severe pain? Pain. You can start early on, um, along with the uh, pharmacological management, you can start with a non-pharmacological management, go for physical therapy, physical medicine, uh, you know, muscle, uh, some, some, in some centers, actually the physical medicines, especially you do the trigger point injections, um, they can, uh, you know, they can um, treat some exercises to uh, help with the contractures, heat therapy, muscles, uh, massage for muscle spasm, other psychological techniques like relaxation, hypnosis, or biofeedback, it's uh, known to have some evidence for pain management. Tens um, is uh, again um, for labor pain. Tens has been used for in some centers. Uh, it's transcutaneous electronic nerve stimulation. Local irritants like uh, capsaicin is chili pepper. Uh, for some, um, you know, some episodes of neuropathic pain, there is a localized area where the um, of of neuropathic pain. You can use uh, it. Uh, it uses a mechanism of counter irritant where you apply the chili pepper or capsaicin um, cream it will um, act on the, on, on, on the nerve fibers and uh, patient sort of you know it, uh, it has acts as a counter written mechanism to, uh, and um, uh, helps with the neuropathic pain and acupuncture um, parental morphine than oral morphine so we always uh, when we go with the WHO step ladder uh, you know, we always go with the by the ladder uh, by the mouth Principle. So we always go for oral, med oral morphine, but there are some situations, just like the NS mentioned about patch. In some situations, the sometimes IV morphine can work better than oral morphine. Um, some centers we use um, IV morphine to um, IV morphine trial when very bad, very bad in you know, a um, severe ten pain pain scale patients can come for a slightly better, a quicker effect than oral morphine, or if there's bowel obstruction. Or again, absorption issues, uh, some gastric motility issues, um, gastric stasis, whatever oral morphine you're giving is not getting absorbed. Is that the reason why patients are in pain? Then you can go for a parental morphine. Lastly, we come to the, uh, this slide must have been mentioned um, when we were talking about chronic pain. So the mechanics of central sensitization of buying depth. So the uh, pain management slide, uh, pain management, mechanics of pain, you remember that when the peripheral nerve endings are stimulated, uh, the, it goes to the nerves and ganglia, and finally is the spinal cord. What happens is um, these, uh, these uh, nerve endings will stimulate the nerve endings that are lying nearby, called the sleepy nosis appears, it will be uh, in a stimulated, and finally will um, uh, act on the NMD receptors and it will cause central pain. So that is through NMG receptors. So NMG antagonists can actually block that and prevent the central pain from happening as central sensitization of wind up can happening. If you remember, the, our lady in the first slide was talking about pain all over the body. So it is not localized to one side and could be a central pain that's causing that. So we can use um, something like so NMG antagonists can be used. So one that I'm going to discuss is ketamine, but obviously methadone, a strong um, opioid analysis is also an NMG antagonist. I haven't mentioned methadone at all in my presentation because it's, it's actually a completely different presentation uh, and most of us don't use it now. So it has been a different um, session itself for methadone. Next slide, please. So beyond the ladder, we think of ketamine. Just like lignocaine, there are some indications for a ketamine infusion. Um, again, I have only used it for two patients, one in UK and one in India, um, where the uh, uh, ketamine, we, we use something called ketamine burst therapy. In UK, I used in a hospice setting where I had a patient with multiple sclerosis who used to get very bad um, spasmodic neuropathic type of pain all over the body, which comes sort of roughly every six months and she gets better after that. Nothing works. So what we did was bring her to the hospice and gave her burst ketamine, which mainly means that we start an infusion of ketamine and give that same dose for three days without changing the dose, if it gets better. And after three at least in her case, what happened was the pain got better and she was pain free for six months. So we're supposed to be blocking the NMD receptors um, you know, by giving that burst uh, ketamine. Here I've tried for another patient who had a very non-specific uh, post-operative pain, which was, uh, wasn't uh, responding to all the conventional treatment. And there are specific indications for using this um, ketamine, which are unlicensed. So neuropathic pain is poorly responsive to titrated opioid and oral adjuvant. So patient must be on all the medications, it must be on a strong, a strong uh, step three medication, all the strong opioid as on the maximum dose, pain is not getting any better. 
all the adjuvants, both the anti antidepressants and anti convulsants should be um, should be should have been tried, and pain is not getting any better. Complex ischemic limb pain or phantom limb pain you can try ketamine. Poorly controlled instant bone pain again has neuropathic element, and uh, abdominal neuropathic pain. Next slide, please. Burst ketamine protocol. Different units have different protocol. Um, this um, has been uh, selected from the I've seen the reference and in this slide there. We start with 100 milligram uh, per 24 hours via syringe driver. Um, this is was, was given a subcutaneous infusion. If effective, you can continue for three days and then stop it. If 100 milligram is not effective after 24 hours, we increase the dose to 300 milligram. Again, 300 milligram effective, continue for three days and then stop it. If 300 milligram is not effective after 24 hours, we change to 500 milligram. And in my case, the patient responded to 100 milligram. After five days, we stop the ketamine, whether it's effective or not or if the patient develops side effects. Next slide, please. Oral ketamine, again, um, it um, can be used in home setting in developing countries. Um, so metabolite, um, metabolite uh, nor ketamine is believed to be pharmacologically active. Uh, so the first pass metabolism may make the oral load more efficient. Um, and the dosage they've given is 0.2 to 0.5 milligram per kg, Q8 thoroughly to Q6 thoroughly. Next slide, please. So um, you, you, can, you can start as an oral route, or patient can be changed from a sub-Q infusion uh, when the pain is normally milligram four times daily. And the dose can be increased to uh, in five or 10 milligram increments. And usually we go, go with the dose, usual dose range is 10 to 60 milligram four times daily. Next slide, please. Which of the following is not a side effect of met metketamine? Um, Psychotomimetic phenomena, hypotension, delirium, and diplopia. Anybody? Diplopia. Hypotension. Okay. Hypotension. That's right. Next slide, please. Hypotension. Yeah, that's right. Ketamine usually causes um, hypertension. Next slide, please. So side effects are hallucinations, dysphoria, and vivid dreams. Uh, most common that that's a psychomimetic symptoms. You can have hypertension, tachycardia, and raised intracranial pressure. Uh, you can have sedation at higher doses, um, erythema and pain at infusion site. So that is that is actually the subcutaneous infusion site. When we go for sub subcutaneous, some drugs are quite irritant at the site. So this ketamine is one of them. Um, so we have to be very careful. We probably have to change this infusion site every 24 hours. Sometimes we can give a bit of uh, dexamethasone along with the infusion pump so that that irritation goes. Uh, some patients can develop urine tract symptoms, for example, uh, frequency, urgency, urgent continence, dysuria, and hematuria. Um, there has been a report of drug induced liver injury uh, for repeated course of ketamine treatment. Um, there was a case report of three cases, but it's not a common symptom. Just as a, it is published in literature, but a case report with three cases. Next slide, please. Last and final step. What if all this fails? We tried everything. We even tried intervention for the patient uh, and still the pain is not getting any better. What do we do? So we just have to accept the fact that we probably might not be able to um, make her pain better. Um, and it's, it's a failure of symptom control. Just like any other symptom, uh, pain might not be getting better. But explain that, that to the patient. You don't actually sort of, you know, give, give up on the patient. We are fellow travelers in a difficult journey. Explain to the patient. Uh, and um, patient and family may someday need help to accept palliative sedation. And usually, you know, once we reach that stage, it, it, it is an indication that they are reaching the last days of life, especially in the cancer pain. Um, it's an indication that it, they could be. So that, that's a time when we should be discussing a bit of palliative sedation. Next slide, please. A palliative sedation um, is an important, um, you know, it, it probably will be discussed in detail in any of the sessions that um, they take for you. It can be, it, it's given for all the other symptoms, all symptoms um, in palliative care, where um, the, it's uncontrollable and it's not managed with our conventional treatment. It's refractory to all the palliative interventions. So the patient, uh, the patients that we select for palliative sedations usually have a severe chronic and life-threatening illness, and um, they must be suffering from one or more severe physical or neuropsychiatric symptoms, and which has not been uh, has been refractory to standard palliative interventions. Here, um, the overriding goal of uh, the patient management is comfort rather than anything else, and um, there should be an active order. I just as discussed in last um, in the last class about um, withholding life-sustaining treatment. There must be an active order uh, existing, depending on the hospital uh, protocol about withheld, withholding life-sustaining treatment. 
um, informed consent for palliative sedation. Again, uh, I mentioned the principle of double effect in the last session. It can unintentionally hasten the death, uh, must be obtained advance from the patient or from the appropriate surrogate decision maker. And staff members involved in caring for the patient should be informed in advance of the plan to initiate palliative sedation. So palliative sedation, obviously, uh, uh, for pain, uh, morphine would be an important part of that because the patient would already be on morphine infusion and the pain is not getting controlled. We add a bit of midaslam to it and you gradually increase it so that the patient becomes comfortable. Next slide, please. Okay. To conclude, um, as I mentioned, 10 percent of patients will have difficult pain. Uh, try and go through the 10-step uh, process um, to evaluate the pain, to assess the pain. There are some role for adjuvants depending on the type of pain. Um, Nicnocaine, ketamine, methadone can be tried depending on the clinical picture. And palliative sedation has a role for a few selected patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunita. And we can have some quick questions. Anybody? Any comments? Or Dr. Rahul mentioned about Silica 20cc. Was that a question? Or, um, yes, yes, sir. What is that? In our setting, we do 2% Xylocard. It's 20 milligram per cc. You mentioned 100 milligram per cc. I don't know. It's available here. I, that's, this was a guideline that I got from Amrita. I think that that is a look and just told to me by an anesthetist um, who works here. So I'm not entirely sure. Uh, do you have any, uh, any experience with that, Dr. Yeah. We use for cardiac uh, tachy, ventricular tachycardia. You use that silica for ventricular tachycardia? Yes. Okay. Uh, in the dose of uh, uh, means two milligram per kg maximum dose means uh, two percent. Okay. And IV we use IV. Right. Okay. So uh, hundred milligram per cc I have not heard or seen. That's uh, okay. was my question. Let me just see. I think I got that from a guidelines. Um, can we put the slide back up? Um, that's in. Uh, yeah, let me just see. I'm just trying to find out where I got that, uh, you know, the, uh, I've given the reference below that um, from where I got that infusion. What I'll do is I'll, I'll check the guideline that I uh, you know, got that from and I'll email to uh, Raj Lashmi who can email it to the group. Is that okay? Okay. Anybody else? Sarai, uh, have you logged on from two devices from same place? GCRA do you have any more comments? No, no. I have one. Hello. Yes, yes, doctor, yes, you can speak. Myself, Dr. Preetir from GCRA, I have one question. In uh, ketamine infusion, you said 100, uh, if patient has no pain relief with 100 mg ketamine, there, uh, ketamine for three days, uh, stop ketamine for, uh, uh, I want to ask you a question, for, we need to stop ketamine for a days or for a hours. So, so you um, what we do is we give 100 milligram for 24 hours. If it doesn't get better, you yeah. can increase the dose to 300 milligram. Um, On the next day? Yeah, after 24 hours, we increase it to 300 milligram. Okay. And uh, uh, 300 milligram, if no pain relief, then 500 next milligram? Day. Yeah, next day. Then you don't increase more than that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Any? Anybody else? Uh, uh, yeah. Sub uh, means uh, at the site of uh, incidence in chronic pain. Uh, my sir has used a uh, uh, point two five percent bupivacaine. For trigger point injection. Okay. Is that what you talk? Yeah. Okay. okay. That must be trigger point, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Bhavana, you wish to ask something? No, no, here is some problem in our telecast. So I hope you are clear now. Are you answering, but we can't see you, and uh, here it shows that your meeting is over. Uh, just want to add a comment more. When you give ketamine uh, infusion or even by oral route, uh, you have to monitor the liver enzymes. And uh, there are uh, literature reports on hemorrhagic cystitis. So you have to ask the patient regarding any burning sensation or hemorrhagic uh, or blood in urine. Um, and uh, you have to also monitor liver functions. Okay. There's a question from Dr. Grace. Uh, majority of our patients with chronic lower back pain of neuropathic cause don't seem to like amitriptyline because of its sedative side effects. Can carbamazepine be used instead? So, um, as I said, you know, you, you could try imipramine or, you know, other antidepressants. Uh, carbamazepine is an anticonvulsant which can be used, but uh, potential for Steven Johnson is there. So, I, I would rather go for either uh, other of the uh, antidepressants or you, I go for gabapentin or pregabalin. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jidin? Uh, hello. Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Speak. My doubt is uh, regarding use of amitriptyline. Uh, I don't have experience in using that for pain relief. But uh, uh, as a psychiatrist, what I know is that tricyclic antidepressants anyway take about uh, two to three weeks minimum for the antidepressant action. So when used for pain relief, how much is the lag period? Does the patient improve, the pain improve immediately or does it take some time? <coughs> Usually we, we start titrating, uh, we start with 10 milligram and within two to three days we increase it to 25 milligram. Uh, and uh, I think it, 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 it doesn't take that much time as antidepressant. Within one or two weeks we, we do have benefit with, uh, for pain management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's right. Uh, usually it will take one to two weeks, and uh, yeah, before re reaching the antidepressant effect, it will give uh, the full uh, effect for pain relief. Sir, thank you, sir. What is the drug of choice for fibromyalgia related pain? Uh, again, uh, it's. Uh, I think fibromyalgia is a very difficult um, symptom to um, treat, as far as you know, chronic pain is concerned. Uh, uh, the ones that I've seen, I've rotated between all these. You know, uh, usually the patients are on start with amitriptyline, just like any neuropathic pain, and then add on uh, pregabalin and um, see how they goes. I don't. I don't think that I, I haven't seen any. Um, some people have you. I've seen them use fluperitine. I don't know whether it's just their experience of using that or. But it's specifically, yeah, I don't advise for that. Anybody else has experienced uh, with the fibromyalgia treatment here? Okay. Uh, I think uh, one of the main uh, treatment, and uh, it's not only the drug treatment for fibromyalgia. Uh, the patient usually will be having a history of chronic pain and will be will uh, might have consulted many 
few physicians and they have uh, told them that uh, you don't have any problem so usually they come to you with um, uh, i have a chronic pain but everybody says i don't have any problem so that will be the usual history so you have to first of all uh, validate their feeling uh, tell them okay you are pain uh, are real and we understand and uh, along with uh, you have to also do uh, you have to make changes in their uh, lifestyle uh, and along with that uh, there are many medications proposed but uh, uh, there is no much evidence i think for uh, none of the medications but usually use the tricyclic antidepressants uh, tramadol all those uh, have been used so uh, i think um, we will uh, move on to patient story uh, so patient story will be presented by dr mega from gcr right dr mega hello yes doctor we can hear you yeah good afternoon i am dr mega the junior, junior assistant in gcri uh, presenting a case of 65 year old male known case of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor of left upper arm operated case of left upper limb amputation with severe phantom limb pain In the presenting complaints complain of phantom pain over left palm since 2015 pain was localized fire like continuous burning in nature sharp shooting associated and aggravated by fasciculation not responding to ongoing medications then history of illness history of excision biopsy from left arm in 2012 patient diagnosed as having low grade malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor no adjuvant treatment received patient had uh, progress free interval uh, of 2 years he developed recurrence over same region and presented to gcr in august 2014 palliative rt was given followed by four quarter amputation in october 2015 patient developed solitary lung metastasis in march 2016 got operated for the same chemotherapy was not given in view of mpnst being non chemo responsive 6 months after surgery uh, lung metastasis developed the new lung metastasis developed so patient was kept on bed supportive care examination patient is hemodynamically stable the vas score was 7 to 8 by 10 with fasciculation and burning pain over left stump on presentation uh, currently with ongoing medi medications vas score was uh, vas score is 1 to 2 by 10 next right treatment and significant investigation initially patient was put on step 2 analgesics and adjuvants tablet tramadol 50 mg tds was started with gabapentin gabapentin amitriptyline and paracetamol 500 mg tds no relief with current medication so shifted to step 3 opioids tablet morphine 10 mg 4 hourly started with rest of adjuvants we have given iv injection loxicart 5 mg per kg Uh, with ketam in 0.5 mg per kg in 250 cc ns over 2 hours for three consecutive days for two times muscle relaxants were also given with this uh, we have given corticosteroids to decrease local edema and sedatives uh, for angiolytic effect morphine dose increased step by step now patient is on tablet morphine sustained release 30 mg 303 with uh, three tablets of 10 mg for bre breakthrough pain psychosocial aspect poor socio economic status good family support but feeling of being burden on the family patient worries that he has to live with medications throughout his life and anxious about what will happen to me currently patient is on tablet morphine 30 mg sustained release 303 3 tablet of 10 mg for breakthrough pain paracetamol 500 mg tds pregabalin 75 mg hs This are called two tablet HS and pentaprazole 40 mg daily and multivitamin. The main concern in patient is worried about outcome of the disease and future and burden on the family. 
in being a being a burden on the family summary of 65 year old male known case of mpnst with lung metastasis operated case of left upper limb with four quarter amputation and with phantom limb pain and psychological pain on base supportive pain the discussion point is other modalities of the neuropathic pain management Uh, we can apply the mirror therapy uh, in uh, which patient feels the movement of his removed arm and hand just like his normal arm hand moving through a mirror normal body part helps reorganize and integrate the mismatch between proprioception and visual feedback of the removed body and we can give a regional block but we have not attempted a regional block in this patient because of altered anatomy thank you So thank you, Dr. Mehka, uh, for this um, phantom limb pain. Uh, so here uh, is a patient uh, with um, who underwent amputation of the um, four quarter of the upper limb, uh, who has uh, psychological pain as well as phantom limb pain. So they have already um, tried on uh, step two uh, opioids. Uh, adjuvants and, uh, and now on morphine so uh, also tried on injection silocaine as well as uh, ketamine so what can be done for more this patient any idea severe pain difficult to manage pain temporary anybody want to comment on the patient story any comments sunita Uh, do we know why the um, going to the uh, treatment a uh, slight plan? Why the amitriptyline was only stopped at twenty five milligram HS and wasn't increased after that? Any idea? Did you go to that uh, treatment slide one? Because in the in the end, patients only on pregabalin, right? Patients yeah. not on any antidepressant. So why why was the antidepressant stopped? Any reason? Any reason? Uh, because patient was uh, uh, fully satisfied with medication, he has good pain relief, and uh, to reduce the number of drug, uh, 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 we think pregabalin uh, is must for this patient. So we have reduced one another medication. And so was it after that lignocaine and ketamine that patient became had pain relief, or before that? Uh, can, can we go to that other slide, uh, Dr. Sunil? The slide which says ketamine and uh, lignocaine was given. Yeah, three times ketamine and lignocaine. So initially, the patient was on step two, uh, so amitriptyline, HS, tramadol. Then, uh, not relief current medication. The morphine was started with rest of adjuvants. Then you gave silocaine and ketamine for three days. Yeah. Then muscle relaxants was given. Yes. And corticosteroids was given. Yes. Okay, and then morphine increased step by step. Yes. So now the patient is comfortable. Is yeah, that what you? Comfortable. Uh, okay. He comes here in the GCRI regularly, uh, every monthly, and he is very comfortable. Only he has a psychological disturbance. So every time we counsel the patient, hmm. uh, he is stable. Yeah, I think um, one one thing that probably I would suggest is if usually when in a patients when I've got like psychological issues more, I prefer to keep on the antidepressant rather than anticonvulsant for the neuropathic pain, so sleep issues or anything like that. If you go in the anti antidepressant door and maybe stop the anticonvulsant, see whether that will make them better. Okay, so you mean to say that we reduce the dose of pregabalin or stop the pregabalin and start the amitriptyline? Like if trouble burden is an issue, then reduce the and that's just my suggestion. Okay, sure, we will do this. Thank you. Or better, yeah. So, uh, does this patient received mirror therapy? Pardon? Does this patient received mirror therapy? Yeah, this patient received mirror therapy. Our physiotherapist has trained the patient 
and he has. Okay, uh, anybody can explain uh, on mirror therapy? From our side, mm -hmm. Dr. Mega mm -hmm. has me. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very good case because uh, for the discussion of phantom limb pain. Uh, phantom limb pain is a very complex uh, neuropathic central kind of a pain. We can't really call it neuropathic pain. It's a central neurological pain kind of because the uh, representation of the removed limb is uh, still present in the brain when the limb is absent. So mirror therapy is one of the most important mechanisms to treat uh, uh, phantom limb pain and it is more important than all the other medications that we give because it is the central part of the pain which has to be addressed. So I think this is a very good case and it's very uh, nice to note that mirror therapy was started along with the medications. So it is like training the central part of the pain mechanism and especially the cognitive part of the pain mechanism to interpret that the uh, removed part can be treated through other modalities. Though it is absent, the brain is kind of tricked into believing that uh, we can do something for that part which is no longer there because the patient keeps on having these uh, complex uh, symptoms of sometimes spasm of that limb or cramps in that limb which the uh, neuropathic medications cannot really address so mirror therapy is a very important thing that can be done and there are uh, videos and uh, other uh, practical things on the internet where mirror therapy can be learned by the physiotherapists if they are not trained in it so we find it uh, very useful for sensory strokes also. Patients who have thalamic strokes and everything, where even pre in high doses doesn't work. Mirror therapy seems to help a lot. And then we can do, uh, we can manage pharmacologically with uh, small, uh, relatively small doses of amitriptyline or even duloxetine and gabapentin combinations. Okay. Um, Ma'am, who does that mirror therapy in your, in your center? That sounds really interesting. Who does it? How do you get it done for patients? The therapists, uh, they went through the literature and they found out how it is to be done. And we also had a workshop by a neurophysiotherapist. For oh, okay, okay. So you have to have a mirror, which is like a wall mirror, uh, maybe one and a half feet by two feet. And that has to be uh, kept uh, there are two ways it can be done. One is a wall mirror where the patient is sitting in front and the other is where you have a mirror which can reflect only the limb of that patient as if the other limb okay. is there on the side. So there are two ways of doing it. So for thalamic syndrome, we do it uh, with, with a smaller mirror. Hello. Yes, uh, Dr. Freddy. Uh, this and last week patient visit to our OPD and this time he has complained about the same pain on the opposite limb. So the limb which is present, patient was complaining this type of pain in another limb. Is it possible and what to do for that pain? Hello. Sorry, uh, uh, you are telling that uh, the patient is describing pain on the normal limb now. Yes. Okay. Uh, and are you asking is mirror therapy is applicable to that also? What What are the modalities? Not only mirror therapy, what can be done for the that pain? Uh, okay. Uh, any comments from anybody? Sunita, anything you want to add? Uh, no, it sounds like the mirror pain once one do uh, gets after code to me, right? So I don't know if it's neuropathic pain. Probably they'll have to restart. If medication is what uh, you know, trying to restart everything back. But I'm not sure whether I haven't heard of this mirror therapy, so I'm not sure whether that's going to work. I'm not sure. You can't comment. Okay, uh, so uh, mirror therapy has been uh, there in literature uh, since uh, long back and it has been mainly used for um, 
um, phantom limb uh, pain uh, but as madam told it has also used in stroke uh, so um, in phantom limb uh, pain uh, a mirror is kept uh, and uh, the normal limb uh, which reflects on the mirror uh, and uh, you can move the normal limb so that the image on the um, mirror will also move. So the brain will interpret that uh, this uh, moving image <coughs> instead of the phantom limb. So that's how uh, it is described in literatures. Um, and uh, uh, for phantom limb pain, um, the treatments, uh, there are many treatments proposed. But um, there are no much evidence to say one treatment is better over the other. But um, uh, gabapentin and uh, um, acupuncture, uh, a, a transcutaneous electric nerve <coughs> stimulation is something which have been used and uh, some people have found it uh, very useful. Uh, so uh, uh, all the other uh, agents used for treating neuropathic pain has also been proposed for treatment of phantom pain and morphine has been found useful in treating neuropathic pain in a uh, short time uh, but uh, we don't know about um, what uh, what is the long term effect of uh, treatment with morphine so, uh, Dr. Preeti, um, we don't know the cause for uh, the pain on the opposite uh, opposite limb. Uh, so, uh, we are unable to give you an answer. Uh, maybe uh, we uh, you will uh, see the patient and uh, we'll review and uh, we will hear more about that uh, in the coming sessions. Sure. We are thinking about to start with um, methadone. Use the dose of morphine, and if it is possible, uh, if it is worth, we'll let you know definitely in the coming session. Okay. So, are you? Uh, did you tell that are you going to start on methadone? We are thinking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I haven't seen uh, anything which uh, uh, which is connected with uh, methadone for uh, phantom limb pain, but we don't know, as you told, uh, the cause for uh, the pain on the opposite limb. So um, if you feel that it is neuropathic pain, and uh, no, maybe uh, you can step up either tricyclic antidepressants or uh, anticonvulsants. And then, if not responding, then you can try with uh, methadone. Okay. Sure. Somebody was asking that uh, can MBBS doctor write uh, um, uh, morphine? Dr. Sanjay, was you there? Dr. Sanjay? Okay. Uh, any uh, doctor uh, who has uh, MBBS or BDS can prescribe morphine. But it will not be available in any pharmacies. It is available only with uh, RMI institution, that is recognized medical institutions. Dr. Pridhi. So, sir, uh, where it will be available privately if we are prescribing for them? Hello. Sorry. Sorry, Sanjay. Uh, we didn't hear you properly. It is available only in hospital uh, setup. Then, if uh, uh, we are going for treatment at uh, uh, home visit, then uh, how it will be available? Hospital. Uh, it's available with uh, recognized medical institutions. So, uh, uh, where are you from? Which state? Gopal, 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 uh, do you have morphine in your hospital? No. No. Uh, so I think um, uh, we can help you to uh, get morphine. Uh, so uh, will you uh, drop a mail to Rajalakshmi?
जी से आ रहा है so the question is uh, for the uh, prescribing vaccine at home is sir the question dr pradi can you ask once more uh, can you repeat the question uh, i think dr sanjay was asking um, uh, how morphine will be available uh, for home care and uh, morphine is not available at his institution so uh, i think doctor is to prescribe the drug from the outside there are few chemists uh, who keep the morphine with them and they have license for morphine keeping and uh, another for home care what we are doing uh, i am uh, saying uh, we uh, our doctors do home care and uh, if patient require morphine they call the patient to institute and in okay. institute we relatives to the institute <laughs> prescribe it from the institute we have morphine in our institute okay uh, thank you dr jyoti okay um so uh, i think um, uh, we discussed mainly about the uh, phantom limb uh, pain in this patient and uh, phantom limb pain is a very difficult pain to control and it just says that uh, uh, phantom limb pain in some patients uh, it will be um, relieved uh, over a course of uh, few months or uh, in few years but in some patients that will be continuing so uh, it's a really difficult pain and um, uh, usual uh, management is with the tricyclic antidepressants transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation um then mirror therapy uh, these are uh, some treatments which usually have been used for the treatment of phantom limb pain um so this patient has uh, another pain also uh, which uh, we will hear uh, more more about treatment and uh, uh, what was the cause of pain maybe in the coming days uh, we will get more information from gcri team so uh, thank you dr sunita for joining uh, today uh, i've just um, I've, i've sent a message with the link of uh, in a doubt that dr rahul asked uh, it's a guideline from the pcf4 <coughs> so if you click on the link it will tell you where the lignocaine dose came from yeah um you know I, i think probably it's because the obviously the western guidelines that medication was was most likely not available in india whatever concentration it's it says in the guideline but that's where i got that from so you can mm -hmm. all um, check that usually 2% um, also i think yeah usually yeah. 2% and 1% lignocaine are available so maybe from uh, uk i don't know okay okay and uh, also the uh, feedback form i think rajalakshmi has sent a link for feedback i'd be grateful if everybody can do a feedback form it could be useful to know you know how uh, effective the session is so it'll be yeah thank you Uh, thank you sunita and um, thank you dr mega and uh, all the others who have joined for this session so we can see you on next thursday with a topic on uh, communication taken by dr biju rakhave so if any problem in between please do write to us or call us so thank next you for thursday, there is no session na no? next thursday communication 15th august is holiday i think there is nothing in list you can join from home so thank you all for joining in this is no any topic on 15th august you have in your list i'm um, sorry ma'am i'm sorry ma'am i didn't get it are you the, in that word file list there is no any topic on 15th august it is oh sorry ma'am uh, no class on 15th august on 22nd august we are having class on communications <laughs> Thank you for the reminder, ma'am. I'm sorry for seeing that. Okay. So see you on twenty second. Bye. Bye.